lot of questions I get are about converters, so let's put that to rest. Ten years ago, you had to be concerned about what converters you were using. Nowadays, the, the top companies all make such incredible converters, the difference is just negligible. I happen to have some favorites, I'm going to share that with you, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that the others aren't quite good. I happen to not like the color pink, so I might not mention those converters. My favorite converters right now. <laughs> that was a good day. My favorite converters are the ones made by Avid. They call them the HD IOs. Uh, I have a couple of those, and I love them. Uh, I'm going to tell you how I clock those in a minute. Another converter, uh, we had Dylan on the other day. Dylan is partial to the Aurora, the Lynx. Those are great converters. Um, the um, uh, uh, I'm leaving one out. If I think about it, I'll tell you about that later. Is it antelope? Well, the clock, a clock with an antelope clock, uh, a lot of people use the Big Ben, which is fine. Uh, I like um, the antelope. I just recently replaced my Big Ben with an antelope, and I feel like I get a little tighter top in, a little brighter top. Now, when I say these kind of things, we're splitting hairs. It's, 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 it's subtle, but, but there, and most engineers will mix to what they're hearing. So if you have a converter and a clock, that's giving you a little low, less low end than another one, probably you're going to mix so that you hear that low end and eventually compensate for it. We're that good nowadays. So <clears throat> the clock, I think, I, I think it's called an OCXV, uh, is the one I like. They make one for $10,000 that's just, that's just stupid. It's just too much money yeah. But um, for clocking. One of the questions I get a lot is about uh, depth and width of my mixes. Uh, Zan, who's, who's the, somebody asked me about that. Yes, somebody certainly did. Uh, that was Freddie K, actually. It's part of one of the questions. Is Freddie? Any, yeah. Okay. Freddie, I uh, appreciate the question. Um, there's a new plug-in. We talked about it with Dylan, this Dr. MS. That will, that will give you width. Uh, Waves has a series, uh, the PS and the uh, S. Uh, the imager series, those are good for adding width to your mix. But I'm going to tell you uh, a couple of things to try. Be careful with this one. If you've got, a, if you've got like, say, a stereo track of strings, shift the whole, uh, convert it to, 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 to mono. So you, 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 you convert your stereo track to dual mono, two monos, left and right. Shift the left track uh, that you're panning left, shift that early like seven milliseconds, shift the, the, the right track late to seven milliseconds. I think I mentioned that in a magazine article. And then hit the mono button, see if your compatibility is still good. And if it's not, to heck with it. Does a, does a TV producer worry about the customers that still have black and white TVs? Should we worry about you know, mono anymore? If you have a mono system, you should be penalized. Okay. That'll, that'll widen the track out a little bit. Another thing to try and do is, on most keyboards, stereo is not stereo. It's actually, a lot of times, they'll just put a chorus on one side and the sound on the other. So that clouds up the middle of your mix. What we're trying to do is, is, is get clarity in different parts of the mix. So if you've got um, keyboard parts that, 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 that aren't really, st that don't leave you a little gap in the middle, pan them to one side and then pan the effects the other way. Stereo on a reverb return mostly is not stereo. Try this. Put up uh, two plugins with the same preset, reverb preset. Pan one plugin hard left even though it's stereo. Pan the other plugin hard right and just slightly have different parameter changes. So like change the reverb time, change some of the decay characteristics, change the pre-delay. And that'll give you the same reverb effect, but it'll leave you a nice space in the middle. Experiment with that. Remember my 300 cycle on the kick drum thing. I'm not going to give you every little detail, but if you want me to, I will later. So um, try those kind of techniques. Also, um, you know what? I just had a thought. Another cool thing to try is if you're doing a ballad or if the, if the vocals are in a really low range, try running the send to the reverb through a harmonizer, put that up an octave. So now 
what you're sending to your reverb unit is not the same octave as what the original sound source is, but it's an octave higher. Now, when you mix that back in with the vocal, it's, it's, gonna, it's a real cool effect. It makes the vocal seem a little more exciting. Um, another, another thing to try is, is take a, a chorus, take two chorus units, pan one left, and at, say, maybe a little ways almost right, but say maybe, I don't know how to describe panning. I guess I, guess I would say if you're using a, a knob, you would pan one side left and you'd pan one side at about one or two o'clock. Then take another chorus unit and, and change the depth and the rate to where they're slightly different. Pan that one hard left and maybe at 10 o'clock. And then delay both of those edges, the, the, the parts that are panned hard left and right. Delay those like anywhere. Try 14 milliseconds to start with. And then feed background vocals to that, things like that. So, so philosophically, the teach you how to fish part is think of ways to clear out the middle, think of ways to give the impression of things outside the stereo field. Now, in the analog world, um, there's an inexpensive, inexpensive piece of gear. Um, it, it's made by Behringer. It's called an Edison. I think I paid like, mine has transformers in it, so I think I paid about 250. But you can get those really cheap on eBay. Oh, speaking of eBay. Uh, I did a little work for you guys today, and I noticed one or two uh, of the of the audio control units on eBay. One of them, I think, was full retail. Don't buy that one. I see them on eBay every once in a while for four hundred dollars, five hundred dollars. Don't pay some, don't pay new for something like that, because when you get tired of it. A little later on in the show, um, if I have time, I'm going to talk about how to use that thing, because that, that that was a good question. Uh, Mr. Friedman, F.L. Friedman, asked a, a question about management. I can tell you how to be managed, but we happen to have one of the most knowledgeable, successful managers here to my left. Zan. <laughs> I don't manage. But, but tell Mr. Friedman, Herb, he, he wanted to know what's the importance of management and why management for engineers and producers. Let's focus on engineers, maybe. Um, I think that... Anytime you have a mixture of commerce and timing and clients and responsibility, um, there has to be an infrastructure that can organize all that because if you don't have that process correct, you'll affect the creative process. And that's not fair to the client and obviously to your personal client. So you're in a mode of having to protect but also make sure that we're responsible to the people who are paying those folks. Um, and then what happens, I think, that if you are ambitious and you want to maintain a certain standard, then you have to um, pay the price. Now, one of the things about that is that there's an art to learning how to be managed. And um, most superstars learn that. It's not automatic. Um, Can you give us an example of that? Well, um, we know artists who often get in their own way by either being petulant or disagreeable or and what you find with the the larger superstars is those issues may still happen but they happen behind the scenes and what's generally presented is a sort of a kind of cohesion and a, a way where um, the manager feels like fighting for you because it's such a personal relationship yeah. it, it really is like a marriage and and the fact that there's a, a, a sort of there's a sense of pride about what you're doing. When you asked me to get back involved with you, uh -huh. I knew it was a gold standard, and we started this 30 years ago, so uh -huh. to come back and do what we're doing, uh -huh. I just think we're having fun. Oh, yeah. But but it becomes easy. So what I would well, I say... Have, I have the fun. You clean up the mess. Well, <laughs> but that part is fun for me because yeah. I represent something good. So it, it's just one of those things that you want to do and search organically. Um, it has to feel right in your gut. And then the results will show both in your work and, and hopefully in your income as well. Great answer. Uh, I want to thank um, uh, Ed Lado. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He works at down at the Hit Factory in Miami. He sent me a great question. Uh, questions. You read that too, Herb. It was pretty well written. I mean, you, you could start a show. But Ed, I ain't going to type that much, my friend. Good grief. My thumbs are like nubs now handling this. Okay, hit er, you guys. Hit er. 
I didn't know if I was hit or her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. From now on, all questions need to be true-false. No questions will be answered. I'm just kidding. I want true-false questions from now on, or, or yes, no questions. Good grief, you guys. And um, I want to give, I want to say thanks to um, uh, a couple other guys that sent in some great questions. Jorg, or Jorg, I think, um, I think that's pronounced, and Donald Valdez, uh, Ravian in the Netherlands. Uh, anyway, great questions. I'm going to talk about vocals right now. I get a lot of questions about how do I treat vocals. This is going to fly pretty fast, so um, we'll expand on this in an end to the layer. Yeah. I think, I think that would be a good one. Absolutely. Think? Okay. On vocals, uh, I work two ways on vocals. Uh, actually, I work, let's say I work three ways. If I'm all analog, which I really don't do too much anymore, I would, I would probably go to um, a millennia, the, the, the EQ, the equalizer. I love those millennia. It, it ha you can select a tube, insert it into your signal chain. It gives you um, a real nice clear top end. Uh, so I like to EQ with that. I like to do my uh, broad brush strokes with that. I like to do my repair work with like a GML 8200. And then I like to run everything after that to a tube tech. Uh, it's my favorite analog vocal. And then on songs like Beautiful, any Brian McKnight hit, um, early Beyonce, like Check On It. Uh, that was the number one I had with her. Um, I think Single Ladies, I think I used a tube tech on her. But, any, but um, uh I like the Gates compressor. It's called a stay level. It, it was uh, we talked about that in an earlier into the layer. Now, on on the plug-in side, when I'm working in the box, what I tend to do is I tend to do my my precision work with the flux equalizer. You go to their website; they make a, a bun bunch of stuff, but the, the 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 big one, the big equalizer, I like. And then for color and for uh, vibe and stuff, I like to use an API 550. And then I also like the Waves um, Neve emulator. I think it's uh, the V series, V3. Yeah. The, there's a V3 and a V4. I like the I like the I like the V3. I use that a lot. And then my favorite compressor for vocals, and as you saw into the layer, I use it a lot. Is the Waves 1176. I like the Blue Stripe version of that for vocals and the Black for everything else. You know, I have a question for you because you mentioned something. Hmm? Didn't. Um, Michael J. Fox used a flux capacitor in uh, Back to the Future. I, I think you got that confused with your... 1280. No, I was going to make a, I was gonna make a genitalia joke about enlargement, but it's probably not appropriate for this. No, nah, okay. nah. that's more my, it's more my area anyway. <laughs> so, but you know what? We got a ton of people okay. in, in the in corner office. Why don't oh. we expand what you're saying? Okay. Let's get some questions in because it, it's okay. full. Okay. All right. Zane, you want to sh shoot us some? Yes. Okay, well, hold on. Before we go, I had a long speech about room treatment. If you're angry about me not talking about room treatment, treatment, send your send your criticisms to Andrea and Will at thisweekend.com. Let's get to some questions. Okay, speaking of which, Dave, the, the first question I'm going to ask is from Donald Valdez, actually. It says, if I bought good studio monitors but don't treat my room, like with panels or what have you. Oh, can I still get a nice professional sounding mix? And is learning my room enough, or is it a battle not worth fighting? Donald, my friend, I'm gonna squeeze this room treatment thing in after all. Don't write Andrea and Will, write uh, Ian and Kenny. All right, <laughs> room treatment. I think room treatment is probably more important than the quality of your monitors. Now, if you've got real crummy monitors, then you're in trouble, but I'm talking about past a certain level of quality of, of your monitor, the room's going to affect what you're doing. Um, I've just built a new place and I'm getting a little extra 200 and I'm getting a little bit of sound reflections. I spent about, I don't know, 40 or 50 hours cruising around the internet and I, I actually feel pretty confident about what I learned. Uh, basically it takes mass to, to control the low end a little bit. so. Uh, you can control different amounts of low ends if it's too much in your room, which tends to be the problem, not too little, by various thicknesses of plywood. The reflections tend to be a problem. You can control that with some foam. Zan uh, actually uh, loaned slash gave me some foam, and that really helped a lot in my room. Um, 
I've made some notes that I'm looking at. Uh, the physics involved with, with rooms are very complex. I've, I've gone and been the first guy in a $4 million room, and it sucked. Sucked as a physics terms. Uh, and, and, and they had to spend a lot of time correcting it. So I would say it's, it's a bit of a trial and error process. If you're fortunate enough to, to, to work with Bob Hodas, who tunes my rooms for me, or uh, Thomas, you, you speak French. Jean Jean, Jean yeah. say it in French. You know, I forgot the spelling, but it's oh, Jean Joie, I believe. It's Jean Joie. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, Thomas Croissant, he, he's he's one of the best there is. Uh, J O U A N J E A N. He's really good at tuning rooms, and he's 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 he's, he's reasonably priced. But uh, Herb is uh, moving a lot. That means I need to move on to the one next question. More, one more question, and we'll wrap it up. What you got, Zeth? Wrap uh, up the whole show? Yeah. On live drums, this is a question from Jeff Braun. For live drums, if I move individual tracks in my drum group forward or backward a few milliseconds to correct phase problems, will I run into any issues? Wow, that's, that's a good question. I experimented with that early on. I was terrified to do live drums, and so I spent weeks and weeks and weeks just practicing, and I, I tried different things like that. Uh, I think in his full email he mentioned a plug-in that actually allows you to do some phase shift, if I recall that yeah, I email. I the name. I actually just... Yeah. yeah. No, no, I, I, I appreciate that, but it does show I read your emails, by the way. Um, I would be careful. A minute ago I talked about shifting uh, stereo tracks one way and the other way. You've got to be very, very careful that you don't affect the groove or anything. Uh, with drums, I tend to just... Live drums... Uh, in fact, you saw it on the end of the layer, the last two that we did. I tend to flip phase a lot. And uh, probably, I, right now, uh, it was Donald, right? Uh, Jeff. Jeff Braun. Jeff? Yeah. I thought Donald. Yeah, yeah, Jeff asked the question. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, if, 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 you, if you feel pretty good about your skill level, I would shift some stuff, but I would definitely if you're working in Pro Tools, I'd definitely duplicate the track so you can get back to what you had quickly. Uh, my first preference would be to uh, flip the phase on it. But philosophically, he here's, here's your teach you how to fish moment. Uh, philosophically, think of the drums as one instrument, not a, a bunch of individual drums. They're individual drums that are mic'd individually, but the sum of it is one instrument. Uh, if you listen to old Led Zeppelin, uh, John Bonham would only allow two microphones on his drums, one on the kick, a ways away, and then, and then a, an overhead. That could be mythology if it is, correct me. Uh, but uh, I've been believing that for a long time. And um, so, so you can mic drums with, uh, with two microphones. They sound like they're having more fun outside than we are in here. Sure I love it. Why? Why? Because it's time for us to go, unfortunately. 